Uh, thank you, Dr. Linikov, and uh, I would like to thank Sages for the invitation to talk about this uh, very interesting topic. The report on we need uh, we need a, a vo uh, sound here. We begin tonight with a report on one of the most sought after and still emerging technologies in medicine. It's robotic surgery with an assist from the skilled hands of a human surgeon. Of course, all surgery comes with significant risks. No operating room or technique is immune from error. But some high profile critics have been wondering about this technique. Is it possible some healthcare providers? are so much in favor of it that it's actually adding to patient risk. So in this current age, um, after almost two decades of doing robotic surgery in this country, in the world, we're going to talk, focus on the United States, it's hard to not talk about the state of robotic surgery without talking about probably one of the most, the hottest topics was about the increased complication. And we're going to try to summarize how probably that we got there. But let's go back a little bit on the history of uh, robotic surgery and just see that in, back in 1985, we have a, a Puma or Puma, which was the first documented robotic assisted surgical procedure, uh, was a, a brain biopsy. Then it was a rapid progression to uh, prostate surgery, the ESOP in 1990, uh, which was a, just ro uh, um, a controlled camera where, with the voice of um, the surgeon, we were able to guide where you went. Same company who made the Zeus, what's called the Computer Motion, uh, which was a, a fully functional robot of arms and camera. Um, and then the Da Vinci robot uh, from Intuitive Surgical, who, who came along, was the uh, first uh, approval for uh, intra-abdominal uh, procedures. And a quite interesting th thing happened back then in 2001, didn't get a much, I'm uh, um, gonna say the headlights, because uh, it happened the same time as 9-11. Uh, here in the United States, but it was a, a transatlantic uh, telemanipulation uh, cholecystectomy done between uh, Strasbourg in France and New York using the Da Vinci system. So the, the, the players on the field we, have, we had pretty much two back then, it was intuitive surgical and uh, computer motion. Computer motion again had the ESOP and the Zeus, and there was a merger, um, you know, questionable acquisition between uh, those two companies. And then Intuitive Surgical acquired uh, Computer Motion, and they decommissioned both the Zeus and the ESOP, made in the Da Vinci the only surgical robotic system in the market, which of course gave Intuitive monopoly. So uh, over time, the other thing that the, the company made was they were. Uh, acquiring patents progressively, not necessarily using those patents to uh, improve or add to the product, but a lot of the time those patents was just shelved uh, to arguably um, prevent competition. So right now there are about, uh, there was a more, close to 600,000 worldwide robotic Da Vinci procedures in 2014, it's a growing number. This is like almost 200% compared to 2009. And um, they are, proliferating in the market. There is new robots coming, probably have dozens of systems coming from all over the world. Uh, but it's still intuitive has the monopoly. Thus, just a um, disclosure, I have no conflict of interest whatsoever with them, but because they are the only system, you're going to hear a lot of their name, going to hear a lot of the Da Vinci, both the, the, goods, the goods and the bads. So. Uh, the new, f new features were actually added since 2000, like Robot had more arms than the, what they added single side technology, multi quadrant, uh, and uh, a lot of computerized augmented imaging. And also, the number of publications had uh, sharply increased uh, from 2014 to, uh, I'm sorry, from 2004 to 2014. And uh, how did we get from that quickly, from in 10 years, to do? to talk about the robot only less than 100 times a year to close to 2,000 times a year. So there was a very interesting uh, marketing strategy from the company. Arms. It's called the Da Vinci, and it's the hottest trend in surgery. The Da Vinci Surgical Robotic System. Its Less dazzling day. technology is promoted everywhere. There are television ads, glossy brochures, 
and public demonstrations at science museums and shopping malls. Even President Obama was invited to test drive a surgical robot. I think soon might be Donald Trump. So, um, so they're very good about um, marketing, very good about marketing, which is great as a company. Like, uh, which our companies could actually be as good as they are. But up to now, there is the clinical evidence is low to moderate in both terms of quality and quantity of what's being presented in peer review literature. Um, and the, the earlier adopters, not early adopters, but the initial adopters in a large uh, uh, quantity of procedures were actually the gynecologists and the urologists. But that actually has plateaued. So how does actually robotics actually still increase in the numbers? Because now they're pretty much uh, advertising, marketing, and training uh, general surgeons to do general surgical procedures, gallbladders, hernias, colon surgeries. So, and if you look at the chart, you can see again that both urology and gynecology has been pretty much stable over time, and the growth is mainly due to general surgery. This is from a, a consulting firm uh, who uh, is an independent reviewer. They have no uh, conflict of interest with any company as well. They just analyze the market and release information so uh, hospitals can actually analyze if they would uh, or they should buy a robot. But among those um, close to 500,000 cases, 52% are gynecological procedures with uh, moderate uh, evidence. General surgical procedures now had just passed urology. Um, but they are even have a lower uh, evidence of uh, being superior than laparoscopy. Urology is still 20% with some moderate evidence, more for prostatectomies. And uh, cardiac and uh, transoral procedures are very low um, evidence that also there's only 4% of them being performed. So next step is uh, there is a lot of hospital investment on this uh, for a few reasons. Demand is growing. Annual sales have increased 41% in the last decade. The question facing intuitive surgical maker... Herb Greenberg has been reporting about Da Vinci for CNBC. He says when a hospital spends one and a half million dollars to buy a robot, there's pressure to use it for as many surgeries as possible in order to recoup the hefty investment. It can take quite a long time, especially if you're a smaller hospital that doesn't do as many procedures. Why would a smaller hospital need a robot? Every hospital needs a robot. That seems to be the, the push. Again, this what's remarkable as we look at the story is this is sold originally to major, major medical centers, major clinics, and now it's filtering down to community hospitals. I love when you say every hospital needs a robot, right? And uh, that's also becoming true. Like the Da Vinci system is becoming ubiquitous in this country. Like one in four hospitals has at least one robot, okay? 67% uh, of all the Da Vinci ro robot procedures in the world, are actually, uh, units are installed in the United States. And close to 80% of all the robotic procedures are done here. So that seems to be a lot, it's pretty good market for them. But at the same time, as a, as a company, as your products are aging, could be cars, could be phones. So like uh, when Apple releases like a new iPhones and the new operating systems, they don't let you upgrade for the newer softwares for the uh, uh, earlier versions. And it's happening the same. So progressively on this country, uh, Intuitive Surgical is decommissioning uh, old Da Vinci. And, um, and as they do this, the question for the hospital is, what am I gonna do? Should I buy a new robot? Do I still need a robot? What's gonna be the next investment? So, and we cannot be um, oblivious to this. In the area of uh, healthcare reform and cost, the uh, surgical procedures, they add up to $6,000 per procedure. And uh, creating value is very important when you're thinking about if you're gonna use or adopt this type of technology. And, and that's very controversial because the high capital costs are gonna be between $1.5 million to uh, $2 million to get a ro robot. Then you have the services being serviced by them. And also there is recurring costs, the instrumentations, uh, the training, the proctoring. Now they have simulators. It, the, the business model is pretty much uh, stratified in selling, training, and maintenance. But at the, other, at the other level, which probably is very important for the physicians, is the lack of additional reimbursement by payers. There is not a single insurance company that would pay more if you use a robot to do a procedure could have done laparoscopically. Even sometimes, or even discussed like um, um, in a few uh, panels during this meeting, that for nowadays you do laparoscopic surgery, even are penalized because you're getting paid less than do open surgery. So 
those are some other key factors should be uh, put in, um, into discussion. Also, this increased number of mor uh, morbidity and mortality, which are associated with the use of the robot. You have to think about this. If there was a wound infection, the robot was involved, when it gets uh, computed the FDA database, you're going to count as a robotic issue. So that's kind of arguable. We should be discussing this as well. And also, more, more importantly, is this broad, those wide uh, range of uh, clinical outcomes. So there was a pressure on the hospitals to acquire it so they can actually compete with the other hospitals and say, hey, I have a robot, I have two robots, now I have four robots, so therefore we are better, so come over here to be treated by pneumonia. But at the same time, there was a marketing pressure on the physicians. So I have a, an email here from a clinical sales director, and I'm going to read this verbatim. Be proactive in finding cases to convert. Be prepared to challenge each trained surgeon every time you see a laparoscopy or an open case. Be unsatisfied with the thought of ending a day without a converted case. That feels like an intrusion. That is a looking for cases that are being done open that could be done in a minimally invasive way and reminding the surgeon that there is another option. Uh, that is not practice of medicine. Be unsatisfied with the thought of ending a day without a converted med case? That's changing medicine. That's that changing medicine. At the end of the day, the surgeons made the ultimate decision on what was the best for their patient. So, the, because of some lawsuits, some emails ended up becoming like, uh, had to be publicly disclosed, and that's why she had access to this. Uh, again, we have a reporter. Uh, she's a physician as well. The other one is um, the medical, uh, chief medical officer of Intuitive Surgical. And of course, they're gonna be having those like uh, fierce debates. But at the, at the same time, it has been many physicians have already complained the fact that reps go to their office and say, doctor, if you're not doing this, your name is not gonna show up on a robotic database. If somebody's looking for you to have a gallbladder surgery, they're gonna go to the next hospital, so you're gonna be losing business. And um, so, how do we are in the current state of robotic surgery in the United States? So we know already the robotic systems are more prevalent in, the, in numbers in the United States hospitals. This, the scope of robotic procedures have increased. They're increasing rapidly. But at the same time, as they go up, also the number of complications, the reported complications are going up. And for this consulting company, they were asking uh, some physicians, and they actually released this, asking them, why do you think that actually happened? And the, the majority of them, that's a physician's perception, I was 30% due to device failure. Others then thought about the, the uh, device operation and the setup in OR, user error, others, inadequate training, main issues. And the other way to track uh, also complications is when you know, physicians report and peer reviewed. And if you do a literature sh search on PubMed, you're going to find that now is about close to 1,000 papers uh, published that ha has some re uh, related information about complications. And remember the first uh, graph that I showed that was increased number of publications since uh, uh, 2004? At the same time, if you see the green is the number of robotic surgical publications, and in yellow is the number of robotic surgical complications is also going up. The other way is through the FDA uh, claims uh, website, which is called the Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience uh, MAUD database. And they had reported since 2007 over 200 non-lethal complications and uh, le a little bit less than 100 deaths. And that's how it works. You go online, you do your search, and that's where you have a lot of variability here because people may just complain about the whole unit, the endo risk, the camera, or something related to it. And they put a lot of, I know it's a very busy slide, but that's what you know, their uh, website, that they, uh, FDA, a lot of disclosures. Like say, the, the data alone cannot be used to establish uh, the rate of events, uh, confirming whether the device actually caused a specific event, can be difficult based on solid information given on this report, and so on and so on. You guys are welcome to log in into the website and, and read them if you want. But pretty much they're saying that's not a, one of the, the best ways to uh, track complications. Right? So now we know that the, the robots are ubiquitous, the procedures are increasing, and what about the regulations behind that? Who should be responsible for this? Patient. Da Vinci is being criticized for pushing surgeons through the training process too quickly. 
Mm -hmm. Tell me from your vantage point, what should someone who wants to embrace this technology have to do to prove their proficiency? Well, uh, first, they need to be a proficient surgeon. The company is not going to teach someone how to do surgery. The company says it's the hospital's responsibility to determine who is qualified and allowed to use the robot. It isn't up to a company who gets to operate. But it's, shouldn't you have a voice? Is it the role of a company to decide the practice of medicine? I think I, if you give a damn, it is. <laughs> I, I believe that we can do our best to teach people how to use our systems and our instruments as well as they can. So that's the question. Is Intuitive that's responsible or any other robotic firm to say surgeons can operate? Uh, is, the, the, is the government or the hospitals? So there are a few strategies uh, for risk mitigation uh, if you think about implementation of robotic surgery. And uh, the ideal recommendation will have a safety committee. There will be a, a multidisciplinary committee which includes surgeons, uh, both surgeons doing robotic surgery and non-robotic surgery, OR managers, anesthesiologists, risk management, quality improvement to, uh, in technical personnel. Same time, uh, credentialing should be enforced, uh, should amend privileges uh, and uh, go through training pathways and uh, approve each specific procedure. I mean, should this procedure be done with robots and why? Also, the sur surgeon's training, you should go from the point, not just going to the uh, intuitive training when you go there one day, go to Atlanta, get trained, and then come back and start doing robotic surgery. Um, you, you should be going through proctoring, you should be going through assisting, you should be going through a, a team uh, simulation, uh, cadaver training, proctoring. And it's not quite simple just to go for a tiny one-day session of training and be proctored or observed by two cases, and then um, be able to be doing those procedures. So then the annual privileging as well about reassessing the, what are the necessary number of procedures performed every year, review the clinical outcomes, and at the same time, you know, review the annual privileging. And if there is any uh, need of remediation, think about what's going to be uh, appropriate. Was it because in a, in a, in a, in an inadequate number of procedures performed, or is it just the volume was insufficient? You can do this through simulation um, on virtual environments or cadaver exercises. So. The other thing that's important about talking about the current state of robotic surgery um, in the U.S. is that we're getting to a point that the monopoly is being uh, phased out. Here, you have been existing in this kind of closed marketplace for a while. There is signs now that there'll be more competition from Google, from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, how worrying is that to you? What's that going to do to the marketplace? Well, we've known for years that um, uh, robot-assisted surgery is important, uh, that it can make a minimally invasive surgery more uh, accessible to patients, and, and uh, we've anticipated and expected uh, the entry of additional uh, companies seeking to uh, broaden the space. So it's natural uh, and it's inevitable and, and uh, something that we've anticipated. We feel really well positioned. Uh, we have a great uh, product line uh, that spans a lot of different kinds of procedures and technologies, and, and um, so it's something we've, uh, we've thought about and are ready for. So if, if Verb, if this partnership goes uh, into the market soon here between Google and Johnson & Johnson, it strikes me that two companies of, of that size, of that might, could drive prices down. Uh, how, how difficult will that be for you? How will you prepare for that? You know, so that's, that's the next big question. Uh, we're getting full of an uh, army of new robots right now. Um, Canada, Europe, um, Asia, here in the U.S. as well. And, um, and which are the new players? So one of them is a Titan Medical uh, Sport, and again, have no conflict of interest in one of those companies. Um, the claims uh, from Titan is that single port, snake-like, is designed for a small and medium surgical field, uh, and is projected to be on the market in 2017. The other one is a, is a TLF AL, uh, ALFX, so far, the kind of long name. The haptics feedback is an open console, laparoscopic motion of the eye tracking, a 3D camera control, so we don't need to be sitting looking down at the console. Uh, and reusable instruments, C market uh, in December was in 2011. Then the, the Med Robotics Flex single port, which you can see is a snake like, uh, clear only for transoral surgery, uh, was uh, the FDA in 2015 and SC in 2014. Uh, like, Robotized systems, this is the, a uh, 
robotic version of the former Spider's uh, system from Transenterics, and um, is currently un under uh, FDA review for uh, 510K, and is suitable for gallbladder, some bariatric procedure, colorectal surgery. Uh, virtual incision. Uh, this one is uh, from the United States. Some procedures have been done overseas. Uh, two colectomies uh, done in South America and Paraguay. Uh, it claims there is a single incision, uh, non-specialized control for the room, and a lower cost. And also others were in, on prototypes, such as this one in, in Hong Kong uh, from the Polytechnic University, which they claim has like one of the best haptics feedback on the market. So going back to that. Uh, discussion that the, the intuitive CEO had of Bloomberg were talking about, yes, there's going to be so many new pro, uh, products and um, systems in the market, and they're going to range from uh, some applications, lower cost, some might be even more expensive than the Da Vinci, and their company going to be playing on the market. So uh, what we're going to be seeing is going to be a variety of new uh, devices that may be as simple as uh, just for a gallbladder procedure or as complex for a transhydrose of ejectomy. So the, the question is, do hospitals still need a robot in this area, right? So what the hospital administrators and the physicians have to consider is, where does their institution stand with their robotic program? I mean, are they being profitable or they're not being profitable? Are their results are being better or not? And uh, should they pursue this? Or they got to be performing the right procedures for the right patients, right? And certainly adopt best practice and protocols for safety. Because uh, see that sharp increase? When laparoscopy was adopted, you, w there was a sharp increase uh, on, um, especially for gallbladder, on common bile duct injuries. But then after it was revisited uh, for training and credentially, it suddenly came down. Uh, and should it be the same with robotic surgery? And then also to reassess the need of expansion of the robotic program. Should they buy another robot, another three robots, or they actually should stop doing robotic surgery? And as a... Um, our final remarks is technology is great. Uh, is like they said in one of the articles, is dazzling. I mean, everybody would love you know to be able to be doing this at a low cost and giving a better outcome to the patients. It, it is still an enabling technology. It will evolve in a much faster uh, way than it has been so far, just because now with much more competitors in the market, like when we had just the iPhone, then we came the Android, and suddenly both of the phones that just get better every year. Telementoring. Telementoring has been uh, one of the topics here um, at this SAGES meeting. And uh, certainly you can do a lot of good telementoring with this with the, also the advantage of being able to do telemanipulation. Remember in 2001, when from France to uh, New York, they were able to do a uh, lap coli. And also there's been a large amount of data being generated which should be used for quality improvement for future procedures. Still very important to pick those four, those four points here. Have to think about cost, that's very important. Reimbursement, how are we gonna get reimbursed? This increased rate of complication is something that should not be uh, accepted. And uh, we have to be questioning, is it better to do robotic surgery for all procedures than laparoscopy? And those are the, the final thoughts. And uh, thank you very much.